They were the heroes of the day, the protectors. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody out of here. Come on, let's go. The rescuers, the men and women who gave extraordinary service to the people of New York City. The historic day began at 8.45 a.m. when American Airlines Flight 11 slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Officers who witnessed the horrific collision radioed for help, and dispatchers sent orders to local precincts to respond. For the fire companies, a high-rise fire meant a first alarm was issued, which automatically called in about 84 firefighters to the scene. Half a mile away in Chinatown, a new ship was starting at Ladder Company 6. We were all in the firehouse preparing for roll call um, at the beginning of the day when the first plane hit. The house watchman got on the intercom frantically he, and yelling into the intercom, like, plane just crashed, the plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. You know, we were, we were out the door before the ticket even came in for the box to call us. We were out the door and on our way. We had done this before. The fire company had responded to the World Trade Center bombing in 1993, so instinctively, they geared up. Police and fire officials set up mobilization posts close to the towers, where units checked in and got their assignments. Ladder companies have equipment to reach people trapped in buildings up to 10 floors, but for a skyscraper, they would have to walk. Under a storm of debris, Ladder 6 unloaded their extra gear for high-rise fires. It was actually very difficult to get our tools off the rig because we had to systematically go there and look up and make sure nothing was hitting us while we were getting our tools. By 9 a.m., the New York Police Department had ordered a level four mobilization, the most serious call to action that alerts all units and commanding officers with the rank of captain and higher. It was also now a five alarm fire, the most dire alert for the fire department. All specialty units and off-duty firefighters were called in. In the lobby of the North Tower, Ladder 6 was preparing to make the arduous climb up 80 flights of stairs when they got the second shock of the day. You could hear a rumble and an explosion, and from the windows on the World Financial Center across the street, the reflection of the explosion came off of that. Another hit. United Airlines Flight 175 had sliced into the South Tower. Undaunted, the six men started their ascent up the North Tower, with 110 pounds of gear on their backs. By the time they made it to the 27th floor, about an hour after the first plane had attacked, they didn't see any more people to evacuate. As they rested in the stairwell, they heard a chilling sound. We heard that, uh, that rumble that nobody's ever heard before, a 110-story building coming down. I just looked at my guy and said, OK, uh, it's time to pull the plug, time to go. If that one can go, this one can go. Yeah, time to go. At 9.50 a.m., the South Tower collapsed. Ladder 6 started rushing back down the stairs. Outside at the fire command post, Deputy Assistant Chief Albert Turi, who was chief of safety on that day, ordered people away from the scene. When that first tower fell, I was trying to evacuate everybody three blocks north, away from every high-rise building in the area, because I knew that this was going to happen in Tower 1. Emergency service units poured in, while evacuees poured out onto ferries that carried them to safety in Brooklyn and New Jersey. Yeah. Jersey City Mayor Glenn D. Cunningham met with two New York City police officers who had just arrived yeah. on the ferries. They had communication with their chief of patrol for a while through cell phones, and um, we were able to establish some communication. That communication uh, was basically their their um, patrol chief asking us to send whatever help we could. We had more than 200 police officers from the Jersey City Police Department, along with 70 or 80 firefighters and EMS people over there. Jersey City Police Lieutenant Mike Luke made several trips back and forth across the harbor and rescued people trapped under fallen debris. They'd be laying there and uh, we just helped them up, pull it off of them and get them up and get them moving again. Inside the stairwell, the men of Ladder 6 knew they had no time to waste, but they slowed to help 60-year-old Josephine Harris. Harris had walked down over 50 flights of stairs from the 73rd floor, and she could barely walk any longer. 
I was trying to move faster. You know, we got, you know, we have to get out of here. You know, I'm just trying to will her to move a little bit faster. But we weren't going to leave her, so. A fire unit always remains together. So all six men stayed with Josephine. They helped her down, patiently waiting, letting others pass. They were just four floors away from the exit when she decided she couldn't go any further. She stopped. She stopped at the fourth floor. And very frustrated, I was thinking, I got all my guys in front of me. We got to get out of here. And that's when uh, everything hit. <laughs> Dispatchers frantically ordered everyone away from the scene. The North Tower was crumbling, and Ladder 6 was still in the stairwell. It rumbled and rumbled, and it was pitch black, and then the next thing I know, I remember the, the dust starting to clear some, and I'm wondering if I'm, you know, where am I? Am I here? Am I not here? I, you know, I was guessing. I didn't know at that point. Hundreds of thousands of tons of steel and concrete had fallen, yet left them virtually untouched. They had been knocked around scattered in the stairwell between the second and fourth floors, a miraculous pocket of safety. The stairway was basically our lifeboat at this time. It was a, a life raft for us. Outside, Lower Manhattan was being evacuated. And police boats, along with the Coast Guard, were stopping any vessels in New York Harbor to protect the city from any further threats. Both the police and fire departments were regrouping. The command post at this point will be CZ Street and Park Road, south of City Hall. Do you copy? They were tending to injuries, clearing their eyes of the blinding dust, trying to get a handle on what just happened. It's about the year in combat. I never saw anything like this. Asked if all of his people had made it out, Chief Turi already knew the devastating truth. But there were some survivors, trapped in a mountain of rubble were the men of Ladder 6 and Josephine. At about 10.45 a.m., they radioed for help. Mayday, mayday, mayday. 45 minutes passed before the men heard anything back. It took even longer for rescuers to figure out where they were. They were asked for my exact location. And I said, we, uh, we're in World Trade Center Tower Number 1, which is the North Tower. You enter through the glass doors. You make a right. Stairway B is the first stairway on the left. We're on between the second and fourth floor. And my five-year-old daughter could follow those directions. But I had to get that out a dozen times. And uh, I heard uh, one fireman reply. He says, where's the North Tower? And I was, oh, boy, we're in trouble. <laughs> Rescue efforts were underway, but the fire department was left in a logistical nightmare. Their equipment was destroyed. Their commanding officers were missing. They organized as best they could. I'm going to report to the chief that's now in charge and see what I can contribute. Imprisoned in a cave of debris, Ladder 6 cautiously searched for a way out, fearful of further collapse and the nearby fires that were burning. They waited for nearly three hours when finally the dust started to dissipate, revealing a glimmer of hope. There's light there. I thought it was an optical illusion. There's light. Uh, we're safe. There's light. Only now did the men see that there was sunlight above them, not debris. They managed to climb out through an opening with the help of Ladder 43, who had just found them. Ladder 6 was saved, but not safe. They still had to navigate their way through the unstable rubble. Now we're trekking 400 yards across all this, uh, these girders and electrical equipment and cement. And then we come to a two-story drop that we have to go down into a pit, across, and back up it again. They left Josephine with Ladder 43 and slowly made their way over the treacherous terrain, braving new dangers. Out of the frying pan into the fire. All around them, ammunition from the Secret Service's New York arsenal was cooking off in the heat of the fires. It was an endless death trap. But at about 2.30, they finally emerged, grateful to be alive. When I got to the street, I seen two firemen from an uh, 18 truck. 
and I just hugged them, and I didn't want to let go. They say they owe their lives to the life they were trying to save, Josephine Harris. She was the one who made them stop on the fourth floor stairwell, one of the few areas left standing after the collapse. It was her time to say, guys, this is where we're going to make a stand, I guess, because she just decided that was it. She's like our guardian angel. She must have been sent to us for a reason. By the time the men of Ladder 6 were out, the site was swarming with emergency personnel. All of the city's resources were mobilized. Pretty much out in full force this evening, uh, southern Manhattan, as you know, we're, uh, we're primarily concentrating on the rescue efforts. As night fell upon the shell-shocked city, police officers maintained tight control of the area, turning lower Manhattan into a ghost town. Police are not allowing anyone past this area. In fact, they want everyone cleared by Canal Street because they're working now with the recovery with the heavy equipment. It's an unsafe area. The New York City Police Department lost 23 officers. And just before midnight of that terrifying day, Fire Commissioner Thomas Von Essen, visibly shaken, spoke about the staggering casualties suffered by his department. 343 firefighters confirmed dead or missing in the line of duty. The greatest loss in the department's history. It's just uh, it's a devastating thing. I don't, I don't know uh, Well, the fire department will, will recover, but I don't know how. By Von Essen's side was Mayor Rudy Giuliani, who now had to answer the question, how did the city of New York recover? On September 11, many New Yorkers woke up thinking about who would replace Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. The mayoral primaries were being held that day. In fact, voting was the next activity for the mayor himself, who was wrapping up a business breakfast at a Midtown hotel, when one of his aides got a call reporting a strange incident. A plane had hit the World Trade Center. And the first report was uh, more in the nature that it was an, a an accident. How could an accident like this happen? How could a plane any plane hit the World Trade Center. The mayor got into his car and quickly headed down Fifth Avenue to the site. As we were driving down, I could see the smoke and flames coming out of it, the top. Uh, but I still couldn't tell how bad it was. It became more evident as the car passed St. Vincent's Hospital. The mayor spotted an image he knew well from drills. Hospital staff in front of the building, gearing up to receive a vast number of casualties. And then, at 9.04 a.m., the car phone rang. We were notified very quickly that a second plane had hit the other tower, and then we obviously knew it was terrorism. Minutes later, he was standing directly under the colossal buildings. On the ground, hundreds of people were running, gasping for air. Above, a steady stream of glass, papers, airplane parts, and bodies. I saw a man, might have been two uh, floors from the top, meaning 102 stories up. I saw him just jump right out, right out of the window. He wasn't on fire. He jumped out of the window, and he came all the way down. The mayor knew his first, most pressing job was to disseminate accurate information to those trapped inside the buildings. And we had to get on television. We had to get on radio. We had to tell them what to do. At this point, although it was a terrorist incident, we were basically following all the steps that we normally follow in a rescue or a fire. In fact, Giuliani's first stop at the scene was the makeshift fire command post, already set up at the foot of the disaster zone. There, he met the fire commissioner and his deputy. I was actually there to ask him, what should I say? What should I tell people? And so the message has to be, get in a stairway and come down. Do not stay there. But how could the mayor reach all those inside? He decided to work out of 75 Barclay, a nearby building, where the police set up their makeshift command post. He headed there. And as I was walking away, about 10 steps away, I saw Father Michael Judge. The chaplain of New York's fire department had been a colleague, friend, and spiritual advisor to Giuliani since he became mayor in 1993. And I said to Father Judge, pray for us. And he said, I always do. I had a smile on his face. He said, I always do. An hour later, Father Judge would be dead, killed as he administered last rites to a firefighter. 9.45 a.m. It was at the makeshift police center, his director of emergency management team by his side, that the mayor learned the attack was not just on New York City. We called the White House, and at that point I heard the Pentagon had been hit. And I asked if that were true, and they said yes, and that the White House was being evacuated. Still, Giuliani was told Vice President Dick Cheney was on the line, waiting to talk to him. I went to another office, and I picked up the phone, and I said, Mr. Vice President, 
because I was going to explain to him what was going on, and the phone went out. Outside, there was a horrible rumble. The building started to shake, and you could hear the you could hear the building being pelted with something. A bodyguard shoved Giuliani under a desk. Then everything went dark. Day turned to night. Smoke started to pour into the room. The place had to be evacuated fast. It seemed like the building was in great jeopardy, that it probably was going to come down. We went to the first exit, and we couldn't get out. We went to the second exit, and we, he couldn't get it open. Someone knew of a third exit. It didn't work either. They were trapped. Finally, one maintenance worker suggested they try a door that led to another building. He went to that exit door. He opened it up. I think everybody, including me, had a great sense of relief when that door finally opened. But relief quickly gave way to horror. Outside, they were now engulfed by the thick white smoke of the tower's remains. Giuliani and his aides were lost and disoriented, an exiled municipal government in the heart of a war zone. Now my mind turned to where do we relocate city government? Where do we go? Where, where, we, we need a headquarters. So I was thinking about going to City Hall, which is only three blocks away. And we started heading in that direction, and I was told that City Hall had been evacuated. Every building now a potential target. We couldn't get through to police headquarters. We tried the fire command post, could not get through to that. And then, the noise. 10.30 a.m., overcome by yet another wave of suffocating debris, a plainclothes detective threw his arm around the mayor and they started running north. It was a few blocks further that they encountered the media. It was Giuliani's first opportunity to do what he set out to do from the first minute of the tragedy, communicate. Everyone in the city should remain calm. The very best thing to do right now would be to remain home. We're doing the best that we can to evacuate southern Manhattan below Canal Street. If you are in southern Manhattan below Canal Street, you should walk north and get out of southern Manhattan. Trying to outpace the cloud of ash, he gave reporters what little information he had. All that we know right now is that two airplanes struck the two large towers of the World Trade Center. We spoke to the White House. There also apparently was an attack on the Pentagon. Uh, we asked that the airspace around the city of New York be sealed by military aircraft. It was about 11 a.m. A bit further north, they decided to work out of a Houston Street firehouse. Still, their troubles were not over. We finally got to the firehouse, and it was locked. So one firefighter was going to break it open, another police officer was going to shoot it open, and finally they picked the lock and got us in. And then we set up a command post there for about 45 minutes, and were able to make contact with the scene. It was the first time the mayor was able to get a real sense of the event, finally talking to his emergency staff, the police, and fire departments. I talked to Governor Pataki. I was able to reach him on the phone. He was at his office in Midtown Manhattan. He had already started to organize the National Guard. They decided to close off the bridges and tunnels to the city. Now New York was sealed from the air and the ground. It was time to talk to the people. At 2.35 p.m., he held the first of what would become a routine in the upcoming days, a televised press conference. The number of casualties will be more than any any of us can bear ultimately and i don't think we want to speculate on the number of casualties the effort now has to be to save as many people as possible but behind the scenes the mayor was learning the grim reality thousands dead firefighters policemen staff and friends he saw that very morning were killed within minutes of telling him god bless you at 6 p.m in what would be his second of four press briefings that day he gave an epitaph I thank God that I'm, that I'm safe. I feel terrible for the people that, that we lost, some of whom I talked to just 15 minutes before we lost them. And uh, the city is going to survive. We're going to get through it. I, I don't think we yet know the pain that we're going to feel when we find out who we lost. But the thing we have to focus on now is getting the city through this. The mayor would call on every city agency to help, including New York's Port Authority. The agency probably knew those towers better than anyone. But with its headquarters in the World Trade Center, could they help? When there's an emergency, you're committed, you stay. Some of the first acts of heroism on September 11th came from the very people who built the World Trade Center. 
They were the first to feel the impact, the first to react. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the Twin Towers were their headquarters, and the safety of its occupants, their responsibility. People were the first priority. They had to be evacuated. The Port Authority, formed in 1921, controls the transportation hubs in New York and New Jersey, including the region's three major airports. They also have their own police force with jurisdiction in both states. The Port Authority built the World Trade Center in the late 1960s. Alan Reese was the director of the World Trade Center and had spent 17 years there. His office was on the 88th floor of the North Tower. He was underground in the concourse when the tower was hit. All these people are running on the mall. My first actual thought was someone had a gun. Before anyone knew it was a terrorist attack or the magnitude of the disaster to come, a life-saving decision was made to halt the PATH trains that connect cities in New Jersey to the World Trade Center. The deputy director of our PATH railroad system, who was with me on the mall, ran to the top of the escalated path to make sure no one would head down the path and call path. And they stopped all the trains coming into the Trade Center. Anybody that was approaching the Trade Center, they didn't open the doors. They just looped through the Trade Center and headed back out towards Exchange Place in New Jersey. And that prevented the thousands of people on a couple of trains from getting off into harm's way. Inside the tower, Port Authority police with special fire training went to assess the blaze. Inspector Tim Norris was the commanding officer in charge of the World Trade Center. In, in a case like this, the Port Authority police will be the first responders to the floor to start the evacuation process. Norris had arrived shortly after the first impact and was conferring with fire officials. Just before 9 a.m., they decided to evacuate the South Tower. Within minutes of that decision, the second plane hit the South Tower. By then, the Port Authority and the rest of the nation began to realize this was no accident. This was an attack. New York City needed to be secured. The various managers at our tunnels, like the Holland Tunnel and our bridges, like the George Washington Bridge, make the decision to secure the facilities, to just shut them down, block the entrances and exits with Port Authority vehicles. Back at the World Trade Center, Norris and the fire department decided to split up he and Alan Reese were now at the Port Authority police desk at World Trade Number 5, a nearby building in the center's complex. There, Reese fielded desperate calls from within the towers. If you can imagine every line just ringing at the police desk with people calling that they were trapped above the fire, asking what's going on, and we were telling them how to get out. While the fires were raging, Norris estimates 25,000 people were successfully evacuated by the Port Authority's first responders. But for those above the impact site, there was no hope for the officers to reach them. They couldn't get near there. They could, it was just too much fire, too much smoke. For those who did make it down, they were guided to safety by both Port Authority police and civilian employees who bravely remained at their posts. My staff were in the lobby pointing people who had never walked down the fire stairs to how to get to the mall rather than go outside, because out on West Street and eventually out on Liberty Street, there was debris falling off the building. So you might make it down safely and go outside and get hit by 10 tons of steel falling or some other flaming debris. Norris and Reese were in World Trade Center 5 when the South Tower collapsed. They were trapped by debris, choking in the dust. When they finally dug themselves out, they emerged outside the building in a cloud of darkness. There were a lot of people screaming because it was so dark and it was so dusty, they didn't know which way out, and a lot of the walls had fallen. So the Port Authority police, because we had the lights, we, we directed everybody to come over to the light, and there must have been 30 or 40 people. And basically, we had a a parade. They followed us. Some cops were in the rear. We were in the front. Norris and his men led the group to safety. Despite the dust and debris, Port Authority officers stayed on the scene, venturing back to help anyone left behind. I got fellow officers that might be trapped. I'm trying to be a hero, but 
I think if you were in this position, you'd do the same thing. Inspector Tim Norris did do the same thing. I went back, and I don't know why I went back. I just thought, I just thought there were more people to be saved. Norris and firefighters cautiously searched for signs of life in the rubble. They found nothing, until... As I was just turning to leave, I saw an, a bloodied arm coming out of a pile of debris. So we rushed over, and there was a, there was a gentleman there who was all bloody. He was semi-conscious. And we dug him out, myself and two New York, New York City firefighters. But before they could get the man to safety, the North Tower toppled. They ran for their lives. And I dove under a, a New York City ESU truck, and I just said my prayers. Norris escaped, as did Alan Reese. But he's not sure about those men he was with. To this day, I don't know if that person survived. I don't know if the, uh, the firemen survived. It's, uh, it was a horrible thing. With their headquarters demolished and their staff scattered, Reese retreated to the Port Authority facilities in Jersey City, New Jersey. Norris stayed in Manhattan and set up a new command center at a nearby college. They regrouped and tried to account for their 2,000 staff members, while also maintaining security around the city. We had very, very serious security concerns that had to be addressed as to how to patrol all these large public transportation facilities that were obviously, in our minds, uh, uh, targets. At Ground Zero, Port Authority engineers worked with the fire department and city officials to determine when it would be safe for anxious rescue workers to go back in. They were able to provide drawings and information almost immediately to the firefighters and the, uh, to the mayor's office of emergency management and then start giving them advice. By late afternoon, rescuers began the massive, painstaking search for survivors. Over 150 Port Authority officers worked at the site. We put all our men in teams so that they could go down and start a search. Because the first day, we were convinced that we were going to find people alive. The effort stretched into an endless day. The word recovery became something more profound. The Port Authority lost 74 of its people, 37 officers and 37 civilians all giving their lives in official and unofficial duty to the towers and the people inside. No one sort of shirks that duty. They, they could have run away. They didn't run away. They stayed to help because it's part of what's in our blood, being a part of the Port Authority family. While thousands of people managed to escape the towers unharmed, there were hundreds injured from the debris and fires. They would be passed from the helping hands of the Port Authority to the healing hands of local hospitals. As rescuers pulled survivors away from the rubble, their lives slipped into the hands of another team of professionals. The doctors, nurses, and paramedics of New York City's hospitals. This is in every way comparable to a, to a war zone and to a battlefield. Dr. Howard Beaton is the chief of emergency services at NYU Downtown Hospital a small community hospital center just three blocks from the World Trade Center. Nobody really thought that a community hospital would ever have to bear the brunt of something of this order of magnitude. But I've learned that disasters don't work that way. They're not so neat and so easily planned for. So you better be prepared for just about everything. Uh, we're gonna make rounds of On September 11th, a producer with a small digital camera captured a remarkable look at Beaton's staff as it battled to save lives and limbs shattered by the terrorist attack. I've been running, bringing bodies back, bringing them to the triage unit. We didn't bring anybody back alive. For Dr. Beaton, the day began as a 24-hour shift in the ER was coming to an end. He was heading home when a bulletin came over the radio. This just into our newsroom, a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. Dr. Beaton scrambled back to the ER. The hospital called its highest level of alert, code yellow. We have different types of disaster plans for different types of disasters. The one we're referring to here is what we would call a disaster plan for mass casualties. This wasn't the first time NYU downtown had found itself on the front lines of a terrorist attack. 
The hospital was established in 1920 after a terrorist bomb killed 30 people on Wall Street. And in 1993, the hospital treated more than 200 victims of the first World Trade Center attack. 93 was really just almost a, a dress rehearsal compared to the seriousness of this. On a normal day, the hospital holds just 200 patients. On this day, Dr. Beaton expected more than 2,000. To make room for the wounded, the staff canceled voluntary surgery, transferred stable patients to other hospitals, and transformed its cafeteria and parking lot into triage centers. At 9 a.m., just 10 minutes after the airplane struck, the first patients arrived. We were very, very busy, very quick. Everybody was moving quickly. Some walked in with minor bumps and scrapes, but other injuries were devastating, the kind of wounds typically seen in war. This patient is a 79-year-old uh, man who had an obvious fractures of the facial bones, uh, basically disconnecting the facial bone with the rest of the craniofacial skeleton. We are staffed to run... As a stream of patients flooded through the ER, doctors and nurses from all corners of the hospital reported for duty. I've worked in the hospital for six years, and we've never been called down to come down to, to help. Internist Debbie Sonnenblick canceled her office visits and joined the triage effort. I knew this was going to be big. This is going to be really big. I just did whatever I could. While medics raced to reattach limbs, clear airways, and stop blood loss, the hospital's engineering staff had another mission, preserving the hospital's electricity, water supply, and air. The smell from the plane fuel was, was very overwhelming. Um, one of my first thoughts were, we better shut down the air conditioning systems here at the hospital so that we weren't going to start sucking in a lot of the black smoke and the smell from outside. Then, at 9.50, the south tower of the Trade Center collapsed. The smoke just rolled down the street like a, a tumbleweed, and, and it became pitch dark, almost like an eclipse. Uh, it, was, it was very scary, very scary. Dr. Beaton and the rest of the staff braced themselves for another rush of patients. We've been told by EMS to expect as many as 500 more casualties as they start to go through the rubble. But minutes passed, and few arrived. This was probably the eeriest part of everything. When we realized that the buildings had collapsed and the patient flow had stopped, um, it was like the aftermath of a nuclear war or something like that. At first, Dr. Beaton felt the problem was one of access. When the 110-story buildings imploded, debris flattened ambulances and barricaded streets leading to the emergency room. But slowly, the real reason emerged. Thousands of people, including eight paramedics, simply hadn't made it out of the buildings in time. There are colleagues of mine, paramedics, EMTs, police officers, firefighters that were all in the building evacuating, removing patients from there. And I'm thinking, what happened to them? And what happened to the victims? Throughout the day, the search for answers was complicated by a virtual communications blackout. The attack crippled the hospital switchboard, and cell phones worked sporadically, if at all. We couldn't get information from the site. We couldn't really communicate with other institutions, so we had to take it upon ourselves. Amid the losses, the night also brought medical miracles. The most dramatic came in the form of a patient known only as Jane Doe. I have been told that what hit her was the uh, landing gear of the plane. Uh, if it had been a few inches further forward, it would have hit her in the head and she would have never made it here. The trauma team operating on Jane Doe had few options and even less time. Her legs, they concluded, should be amputated. But one surgical team member, a foot specialist, begged for more time. Slowly, meticulously, the surgeon reconstructed the woman's lower torso, legs, and feet. Just four days later, she was breathing on her own and thanking the hospital staff she'd come to consider friends. I'm so thrilled and so impressed with the people who have spent time with me. They've changed my life for the better. And I love them. By the time the sun rose on September 12th, the staff had treated more than 1,000 victims of terrorism and provided care to 200 rescue workers injured at Ground Zero. A Herculean effort, but just one small part of what officials had to wrestle with that day. And as each crisis unfolded, one man shouldered the burden of coordinating it all. Since September 11th, 
one man has played a role in every recovery effort. Every evacuation order. Every decision to shut down the city street or subway line. What we should do is set up a monitoring point. He is Richard Shearer, the director of New York City's Office of Emergency Management, or OEM. There's no book on, on, a, on a disaster of this magnitude. The number of people uh, that have been uh, killed and missing is just uh, beyond comprehension. The OEM was created in 1976 as part of the police department. Today, it marshals the response to any crisis that threatens the safety of New Yorkers. The morning of the attack, Shearer, who reports directly to Mayor Rudy Giuliani, happened to be in a meeting at City Hall when he received an urgent message from OEM headquarters. The World Trade Center had been hit. Moments later, Shearer issued his first order. Thinking that we were going to have thousands of injured people, and they said activate the hospital plane. As Shearer scrambled to the attack site, he dispatched more commands. Shut down traffic in Lower Manhattan and close every bridge and tunnel in the city. Five minutes after the attack, Shearer was at ground zero, huddling with the city's fire and police commissioners at the base of the burning building. But as they began their work, the unthinkable happened all over again. Oh, my God. At 9.03, the second plane pierced the skin of the second tower. I was concerned that now it was clear this was not an accident, it was an atta a terrorism attack, that there could be other planes. Shearer says he tried to get a message to NYPD Aviation, telling it to do everything in its power to keep other planes away from the World Trade Center. We need to make sure another plane doesn't hit this building. He also tried to phone the mayor, who was on his way to the location, and warn him that it might not be safe. I was trying to get a message to him not to come in a certain entrance because it was dangerous. Uh, things were falling from the building and didn't want him to come in that way. And we were having a hard time communicating. Minutes later, Shearer and the commissioners joined Mayor Giuliani in an office building across the street from the towers. They sent messages to the Coast Guard and the Pentagon, itself under attack, asking the agencies to seal the city's harbor and airspace. Then, just before 10 o'clock, an unforeseen setback. I was talking to my office on the radio. We had good communications, having them make calls, opening up, getting agencies in there. At some point, and, and really you lose track of time, uh, one of my deputy directors got on the radio and told me we'd just been ordered to evacuate the building. That building was the home of Shearer's state-of-the-art emergency operations center, a bulletproof bunker designed to weather hurricanes, blackouts, and bombs. It was a dazzling array of manpower and technology. Workspace for 58 government agencies, computers pinpointing every sewer line and subway tunnel, hotlines to the police and fire departments. But on September 11th, there was just one problem. The $13 million facility was located on the 23rd floor of 7 World Trade Center, and Shearer's staff had to evacuate. When we lost the, the city's emergency operations center, that was the one thing we needed the most, and we didn't have it. And the situation was about to deteriorate dramatically. At 9.50 a.m., Tower 2 collapsed. Shearer needed to respond, but first, he and the mayor had to escape from a building that was in danger of crumbling, too. We couldn't get out of the building. The building was being hit by uh, debris. Tried four different exits, and fortunately, there was a janitor who really knew his way around and got us out of that building. When we got out of that building, we walked out until, uh, to a scene that uh, you, you think was a science fiction movie. Then, at 1029, the other tower came tumbling down. Hundreds of rescue workers, including some close personal friends of Shearer, were inside when the building fell. 343 firefighters. That's a number that's behind comprehension. Um, 20, 23 New York City police officers, 39, I believe, is Port Authority police officers, three court officers, EMTs. Oh, this is the worst I've ever seen. People whose only role in life was to save people. Yep. For Shearer, there would be no time to grieve. With the World Trade Center gone and their emergency operations center compromised, a new command post had to be found, fast. 
Shearer, the mayor, and other top officials headed north, away from the road. I say we still go north. We kept going and kept moving. The cloud of dust from the first explosion was starting to dissipate. First, they settled in a firehouse 20 blocks away, but that office was too small. By noon, they had landed at a new location, the police academy. We went to the library. We took the library and made it into an emergency operations center, which is, uh, we had about 30 agencies. Inside, Shearer supervised rescue efforts and communicated with agencies working at Ground Zero. One of the first things we do is check what buildings are habitable, what buildings are in danger of collapse to make sure we have nobody, had nobody in harm's way. Then, at 525, more devastation. Seven World Trade Center, the home of Shearer's prized operations center, collapsed. Somebody comes in and says, don't worry about number seven, it's gone. It just had fully collapsed. In the hours and days following the attack, coordinating the search for survivors was Shearer's top priority. And as teams dug through the charred wreckage, he made sure they were equipped with the latest technology, search robots, radar and laser imagery is, to help uh, steer the firefighters uh, away from the danger. The teams that are out there working now have it, know exactly where they are in the field, how high it is, where they have to go. Excuse me, guys. Remarkably, 48 hours after the attack, Shearer had a new emergency LJ, operations LJ. center up and running. Calls. No calls. No calls so far. Good. Inside, 500 people huddled around the clock in this converted cruise ship terminal, coordinating every aspect of New York's rescue, recovery, and cleanup. More than 100 agencies worked side by side, sharing information and directing their troops in the field. Have your IDs out, ready for inspection. Police officers, sanitation workers, even web page designers. All the tools needed to put New York City back together and even get Wall Street up and running just six days after the attack. First thing we did was get them the infrastructure they needed, get them electric, telephones, water get them transportation that they can get their employees in, clean the streets, make sure that they can get in and get out. Three weeks later, the pace showed little sign of slowing. Thousands of people were still homeless and displaced. Hundreds of businesses still shut down. Yes, they've taken some of our most precious lives, but they have not taken our spirit. The spirit of democracy is stronger than these cowardly terrorists who attacked us. Of course, for many Americans, getting back to normal might mean resenting or envying or just plain hating New York with its swagger and its cockiness, but not after the 11th of September, not after what the city showed the world it was really made of. Resilience, empathy, bravery, tenderness, and grit. No other city in the world could match it that day. It was enough to get the country singing not only God Bless America, but also New York, New York.